Hello, hello, everybody. It's 12.05 a.m. Central Time on the 5th of October, 2022. It's Wednesday here in the United States. Hope you're doing well. If I sound a little different, it's because I don't have any kind of sound behind me. It's a little bit quiet in here. Hope you're doing well again, like I said. We are here to talk about seismic events. If you don't know where you're at, you're on the Earthquake 3D former live stream. I say former because we're off again, apparently. Shut off. Again. Tonight. Anyway, we're here to talk about seismic, so let's just take a quick look at Earthquake 3D, see what's currently showing for the last approximately 48 hours. You can see the earthquakes raised high off the globe. Those are earthquakes that are deep down into the Earth. The higher they are off the planet, the deeper they are down into the Earth, down below the plates. And now we're looking at the round Earth. However, I do understand there is some debate on that, and I'm willing to totally get into that at some point, guys, because it there's something wrong with the way we're being shown the planet. But I don't have time to get into that now. We're just here to talk about earthquakes. So let's just jump right into it. Let me get a display capture turned on here just so you can see what I see a little bit better. I've got a bigger mouse on the screen for my viewers. Uh, I've noticed my mouse was a little small on screen. Literally impossible to see on a 4K screen. So anyway, our deep earthquakes, take a look at it. Where our letter D is here at Tonga. I'm going to open up something here. The USGS plate boundary map. I'm going to be showing this through the rest of the update. And I would urge you just to kind of memorize where the lines are as we go along. And after you watch a few dozen to a hundred times, you'll finally get it and it'll be memorized where the plate boundaries are. And when I show the earthquakes here on the screen, you'll see the arrows. The arrows are just really going along most of the plate boundaries. And we spread out from a few points that are not on the USGS map. But for instance, we have deep earthquakes down below this triangular shaped bend of the Indo-Australian plate coming up from down below deep earthquake activity. And then what we tend to see after deep earthquakes is shallower, larger earthquake activity that comes up and spreads out and away from where the push is coming up from down below. So something lifts up on the underside here and it spreads out and away to the west, out and away to the south, out and away over to the east by northeast across over across the Pacific. Now this leads nicely with the deep earthquakes that are taking place here at our letter D and deep earthquakes that are taking place here at our letter D all the way on the opposite northwest side of the Pacific up next to the Sea of Oktusk at Kamchatka. The deep earthquakes are a sign of something going on down below the plates. Obviously there's something going on down below the plates and then from that coming up through the plates we see shallower larger quakes within days. So what's going on? Let's jump over to my YouTube page really quick and just go up here and show you. As, again, this is my YouTube community page. And up here I have a post talking about the X-Class solar flare that happened about a day and a half ago. And I've told my viewers this many times in the past, and we've seen it happen many times in the past. After an X-Class solar flare, it takes about two to three days for the charged particles to arrive to Earth. When they arrive to Earth, of course, we get the northern lights. We get radio interference. Everybody knows about that. But after the northern lights, the electrical potential on those northern lights is immense. And it gets captured, a lot of it, captured by the Earth's magnetic field. I know there's some debate on that, but you're welcome to go down and read more on this if you want. But it goes down to the core of the Earth. And the core of the Earth is not a solid ball of metal. It is actually in a super ionic state, ions being electricity, basically, or free-floating electricity in a gaseous state. And it's gaseous, vaporized metals, vaporized elements, the heaviest elements on the chart, vaporized by a giant plasma torch, which is fed power through the ionosphere that comes down through the magnetic fields. And whether you think, again, the Earth is flat or round or the sun is projecting down on Earth or we're going around it, uh, either way, there are charged particles that are coming in that light and that light is hitting a certain side of the Earth at any given time. And that side of the Earth, whatever side of the Earth is facing the sun on the day that the solar storm arrives, two to three days after the solar event happens, then it goes to ground. 
Then two to three days after that, we see a upwelling effect and shallower, larger earthquakes show up. So let me just quickly sum that up. Solar storm happens, hits Earth, takes about two to three days to get here. Then it takes about two to three days to process through, down through the planet, and come back up. And within five to six days from the point where the solar storm happens, within the week, we get huge earthquake activity when it's Earth-facing. So when I made a post earlier today, people came over first and started denying that there was an earthquake-sun relationship, even though the studies already came out on that about a year and a half, two years ago. And then they went on to say that, well, Dutch, okay, maybe it's coming towards Earth, but it's just going to be a glancing blow. Well, those tend to have more of an effect than direct hits sometimes. Sometimes. There has not been a time when there's been an X-class solar flare facing Earth in any direction, whether glancing or head-on, that I have seen where there has not been some kind of subsequent excitement that happens seismically. So there's X-class flares, and then within a few days to a week, we're seeing major earthquake activity, and it usually starts with deep earthquake activity like this. So it's already been a day and a half. Within a day, we will have the charged particle arrival to Earth, and then your guys, sky's the limit for how large we could go on this. Uh, again, I would think we would go the next step up from where we were. So if we were at 7 to 7.5, we would go the next step up to upper 7 to low 8. And the number of deep earthquakes would certainly start to increase more than three that are on the screen here right now for the last day to two days. So we'll see multiple new deep earthquakes, and we will see shallower, larger earthquakes that are intensely larger, incredibly larger than where we were. When I say incredibly, when we go from a 6 up to a 7.9, that's almost a hundredfold increase in power, for instance. So it's a big deal. People will try to downplay it. And the people who try to downplay it, I don't know. I mean, it's like there's some kind of shill army that shows up whenever this stuff goes down. And they go into denial mode. I don't know. It's almost like there's a firm, <laughs> some kind of cubicle farm of Russians. Niet, niet, solar flare, niet. No, I, mean, I don't know how to say it, but whatever they would say to say no. Oh, niet is no. Okay, all right, good, all right. Now, let's go over to the west and just take a quick look and see what's happening on the west side of the Pacific, we have equidistantly spaced earthquakes again, about the same size. So we're dealing with 4.6, 4.4, and 4.4. And the spacing on that is somewhat equal if we're going around the bend of the plate and then up off the coast of Japan. It's really three sets of near 4.4s. One's a 4.6, but then we go down here and check it out. 4.4, deep, 4.4, shallow, and in between them, a 4.9. And the 4.9 is around the U-shaped bend of the plate boundary. Sure, it's a lot 4.4 going on. Over to the west, check it out. 4.4 and a 5.1. Up to the north, a 4.5 and a 5.0. And over to the west, hush, hush, all the way across Sumatra and Java. Now I need to take you back just a few days. Check it out. See this? 5.9 and a 5. A 6 hit. And a few fatalities happen on the coast of Sumatra. And look where the earthquake struck, the big earthquake. Notice it is smack in the middle in between the two previous and current earthquake that's on the screen here now on either side. And now, almost like a two-arm scale where we're balancing in the middle. Okay. Now up to the north we go, up into China. And lo and behold, another 4.4, 4.6, and a 4.7 from yesterday. 4.4 from this morning, 4.6 from a few hours ago, 4.7 from yesterday. Like I said, another 4.4. Let's go over to the west, see what's going on. Up at the Afghanistan border, whoa, whoa, whoa. Another 4.4. Uh-oh. Starting to get a little weird. This is like the next level up of Freemasons. The 44th Society. I don't know. It's my new society I'm creating now. It's not secret. Now, we'll go over to the West and check it out. The combined total of all the activity that came out of the West Pacific, we're going to go back to the USGS plate boundary map. Take a look at it this way, the red lines. All those 4.4s and 5s added up, went to the West, and at the pinnacle tip where the plate boundary comes across and goes into Iran at Turkey's border, we got the biggest of the bunch, the next magnitude up. 5.4 and a bunch of 3.4s. 
and I'm not exaggerating, 3.4, 3.4, 3.4, 3.4, and a 5.4. Yesterday's 5.4, down on the plate boundary down at Crete, really just a sign of the wave that's inundating the whole plate boundary from Crete down here at South Greece. 5.4 yesterday, 5.4 today. And it's not that we're moving from here over to the east. It's that both the earthquake out in front over to the west and the current earthquake today, 5.4 at the Iran border, both are caused by an inundating wave. The wave arrived first over to the west. And then, of course, it's sloshing around or going back and forth like in a wave tank. That's why we get, are getting somewhat equal distant spaced earthquakes, equidistant, and they're all about the same size, literally the same size in many cases, till where they pull back up at the end of the tank and reflect back to themselves. Over to the west we go, up into the north part of the plate boundary up in Italy, where last week we issued our warnings for the first fours and near fives to strike in Italy in many months' time. We warned Norcia, we warned North Italy, we warned South France, all three for mid-range four to upper four activity. It had been months since any of them had been hit. All three were hit. Now we have a new earthquake on the south side of the plate boundary, North Italy, Northwest Italy. It's small, it's three. But back behind it, look what we have, 5.4s. Now something else is going on. We'll get to Italy, back to Italy in a second. Over to the west, Gibraltar. And at Gibraltar, we're at mid-range four. Look where we are. We are on the south side of the plate boundary that comes from Spain, goes down to Morocco. Over to the west, it goes over to the Azores. But I have something to report to you. Coming back to my YouTube community page. And we're going to see a post from Bushcraft Bear, who's back over in La Palma. I think he's from there. And great guy. He's doing exploration and hiking. But he took the time to show the volcano and new smoke coming off the back side of the crater that formed this past year. Now I can confirm 100%. There are no trees on the back side where that smoke is coming from. You guys may remember all last year for about almost, I want to say it was six months, steady eruption. Maybe it wasn't six months, maybe it was four. Anyway, many months of steady eruption all over this thing, covering it in hundreds and hundreds of feet of fresh volcanic rock. So there's no trees over there on the back side. It literally was scorched away, just like the front side. So any kind of smoke coming from back there would be a release of some kind of heat. And smoke is a relative term. It could be anything from sulfur dioxide and uh, other kind of burning gases, gases released, to actual smoke of some kind from burning rock, magma, lava down below. So we'll have to wait and see. It is interesting to see that there is some kind of activity going on there, even if it's just a little smoke, because of what's going on here at the plate boundary. Let me take you back in time. Till before La Palma erupted. It had been how many years? Many, many years since La Palma had erupted. And first, a 5.0 range earthquake, I think it was a 4.8, struck here, pretty much right here, the exact spot that we're talking about now. Then, a series of earthquakes crept north, let's go back to the USGS map, crept north up into Spain, and the fours went to upper fours, went to low five. It was some debate whether or not it was a 4.9 or a 5 in South Spain. It was enough to knock buildings down and cause major damage. Big deal. Or maybe it didn't knock buildings down, but it caused major structural damage. It was a big deal for the earthquake. It was a shallow 5, which doesn't sound like that much, but over there with the stone structures and so forth, caused some problems. So first, earthquake struck down in Morocco, near 5, then went across and crept up into Spain at right at 5. When that happened, I talked about the flow, this seismic flow of the same sized earthquakes going around the planet. And I talked about how it reached out over to the red lines here, red lines following the plate boundaries. And that the next stop is normally out here at the Azores. However, something appeared to be happening there, right at Gibraltar, which drew my eye in the direction all the earthquakes were pointing, which was down this way, down to the Canaries. So I issued that warning for the Canaries. And of course, the professionals came out within a few days and confirmed that the volcano was getting ready to do something. And then it really went. It blew. And it blew for many months. It was kind of record-breaking almost. So I wouldn't say completely record-breaking, but it was intense. 
So I don't think that's going to happen again yet. But with the smoke coming out of La Palma, I mean, Bushcraft Bear just uploaded the video. You can't, I didn't tell him to. It just is by chance, if you want to think that's chance, with the earthquakes going on up to the north in the same trajectory again. So let's wait and see. I'm not saying it's going to erupt, but with seismic up to the north, up at Gibraltar. If anything, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is that right? A new 4.9 just hit at 1539 UTC. Hold on. Why did I not see that? <clears throat> okay. All right, about 10 hours ago, this 4.9 hit. It was covered up by all the other earthquakes, apparently. I don't know. No? No? No, man. No? <laughs> it. Okay. Whatever. Magnitude was just brought up. Okay, so we have a 4.9. Let's, let's put this all together and call it a 5. We have a 5 up here on the plate boundary. I can't believe they just changed it. Okay, we have a 5 on the plate boundary. And we're going to look, just watch, just in case, down at La Palma for some kind of volcanic activity to take place. Now, why would I look for that? Let me explain one more time. A wave is traveling from over here, a seismic wave that's thousands and thousands of miles long between the peaks and the valleys or the peaks and the troughs. And everywhere along the way, it's dropping off 4.4s to 5.4s all the way across. And we're reaching over to here where we're at 4.9. So 4.9, 5, reaching out over to the west and then out to the west at the Ricky Jane's Ridge. <laughs> I can't pronounce it proper. Rick, Rick Jane's. People tried to tell me to pronounce it properly. I said, what? Now, people are asking me, is this an undersea eruption? Now, I think the professionals would be able to tell us, don't you think? I mean, you'd be able to hear it, wouldn't you? I don't know. Hydrophone should be able to pick up some kind of magmatic eruption if it's some kind of blasting going on under the ocean. Be the biggest kept, well-kept secret? Why would they be keeping it a secret? It's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's supposed to be spreading, right? Shouldn't be a big deal if it is. Anyway, okay, so let's get serious now. A line of earthquakes coming out of Europe, reaching over to Gibraltar. We have to be very, very vigilant on this because if we see the Canaries blow again, that'll be a just... I hope it doesn't happen. Hope, right? Speaking of hope, let's go over and check the Volcanic Ash Advisory Center. See what's going on with the volcanoes. We hope to not see any large blasts. I'm also going to look for any new volcanoes we don't normally see on the list. Okay, Suvaniza Jima in South Japan. Nevado del Ruiz in Colombia. Suvaniza Jima in Japan again. Sanjay in Ecuador. Sakura Jima in South Japan. These are all fairly small, a few thousand feet high. Nishinoshima in Japan. Okay, wow. I wonder how many times that's on the list. That's down on the Izu Ridge out in the ocean. And it rose above the ocean a few years ago. Fuego in Guatemala. Popocante Patal in Mexico, Sabangaya, down in Peru, Nevado State Chilean. Hold on. Oh, dang. Hold on. Ads, of course. What is going on here? Weather. Cloud cover. Can't identify it, but seismic signature of something going on at Nevado State Chilean down in Chile. Well, this would be the first Chilean eruption in a very long time. Nevado del Ruiz is up in northern South America in Colombia. I'll show you where these all are, since we have a new one on the list, and Nishinoshima is there. New one being Nevado State Chilean. I mean, it's not like it's rare, but it hardly ever happens. It only happens when we're going through some major seismic unrest. So let's start in Central America. Why not? Right here. Okay, Popocate Patal, Mexico City, exploding. A few thousand feet high, up to 10, 10,000. And then here, Fuego in Guatemala, also going. Now we'll skip over the rest of Central America, which is somewhat rare. Two volcanoes in Central America. Then we get into Colombia, and here, Nevado del Ruiz volcano. Then further to the south, we have Fuego. I'm sorry, we have Sanje and Reventador here at Ecuador. So let's recap. We have one, two, three, four, five. Then we go down south or into central, well, central South America. That's Sabancaya in South Peru. 
And then we get all the way down here. We have Nevado de Chilean, right where the arrow says travels underneath. So that's a fair increase from where we were, which was next to nothing last week. Well, when I say next to nothing, there were a few, but adding in Nevado de Chilean down to the mix, Nevado del Ruiz up to the north, and then in between one, two, three, South America starting to go with volcanoes. And what does that mean? Well, going back and look at the seismic, compare that to where the earthquakes are over the past several days. The earthquakes up to the north, an equal spread of near fives, 4.9s, 4.8s, with 4.4s in the middle now. Down to the south, it's 4.4s, 4.4 and 4.4, with 4.8s from yesterday. But today, 4.4, 4.4. Up to the north, 4. Point, and I'm showing you everything 2.0 and greater, guys. So this is, again, 4.4 and 4.6. <laughs> not joking it really is the same sized earthquakes all the way around the freaking planet now we go all the way down to the south sandwich islands which just a few days back got a pretty large earthquake 6.5 that's at the tip of antarctica or whatever you want to call those places down here if we want to go down and investigate turns out the u.s military and every other kind of military fly in and sink you don't go investigate all right so that means we have to go investigate by the way all right, now, check it out. Looking across the west by northwest Pacific, new deep earthquakes. See Voktusk. No new blasts up here. So let's recite the volcanoes up here in the northwest Pacific and west Pacific and compare. So up here, Kamchatka, nothing. Or nyet. Uh, how do you say zero in Russian? I don't know. Or is there one? I don't know. Anyway, there's nothing here. Nothing erupting up here in Russia. We go down to the south. We get into Japan. And we're clustered out here over to here. Or really from South Kyushu, Japan, over to the Izu Ridge. And in South Kyushu, we have Sakurajima and Suwanizajima. Over to the east, we have Nishinoshima out here in the ocean, which rose up out of the ocean at the Izu Ridge volcanic chain. I can show that to you here on good old, beautiful Google Earth. Here's Japan up here. Oh, wait, we'll bring this back north. And zoom in on the Izu Ridge. See all the volcanoes here. Nishinoshima is right here. Rose up out of the ocean a few years ago. Pretty impressive. Pretty cool looking. Now it's several thousand feet high above sea level. Proof they can build up pretty quick. Thousands of feet in a, a year. Okay, so recapping deep earthquakes, shallower, larger earthquakes incoming. How much larger? Man, with the solar storm, guys, I know there's a lot of people in denial about the solar sun, act, the solar earthquake sun activity having earthquake effect. I do not recall a time where we had X-class flares coming towards Earth, even if it's a glancing blow, where we did not see big earthquake activity. And then we can reduce down the areas in between our current deep earthquakes to find the areas that are going to be hit most likely with the large earthquake activity. So we look between our deeps for our shallower, larger earthquakes. That's why it's very important for us to see the deeps, know where they are, and then we can find the halfway points between them. It's all going to happen in the next few days. Okay, same size earthquakes spreading out over to the East Pacific 4.4s along the coast, going up to 4.8. And 5s, of course, 5.4 to 5.5, just like the other side. And I didn't even talk about this. 4.9, coming across. Coming across what? Uh, well, I don't know if I should tell you. Should I tell you? Do you want to know? This is like the, the famous red pill, blue pill moment in the Matrix. Like, if I tell you, we can never go back and you guys will be screwed forever. You know, in the movie The Matrix, he goes to see, Neo goes to see the bald kid, the bald kung fu kid, and he tells him about how there is no spoon. Let me remind you guys, if there is no spoon, then that means there is no red pill or blue pill. Turns out the red pill and blue pill are tracking programs to make you stand out in the matrix so they can find you and suck you out in a vacuum and make you eat gruel and fight machines. Now I'm going to zoom in here. And really, we're zooming in on the supposed Central Eastern Pacific. But really, we're going to come in here right next to a place called Rapa Nui. 
which is famously known as Easter Island. It's, this is the volcano there. And there's a volcanic group here, two, two volcanoes that come up above sea level. And I showed everybody in an update previously that if we go from the middle of these two volcanoes and we measure over to the west to the middle of these two, called the Pitcairn Islands and the Adam Seamount, it's 1,400 miles from the middle of these two to the middle of these two. And then if you measure from the middle of these two over to the west to the middle of French Polynesia, guess how many miles it is to this island right here that looks like a giant triangle arrow pointing to the west even further and a pentagon here. But this is 1,400 miles. Now, wait a second. It points to the west. And we go 1,400 miles to the west. Check it out. Well, first of all, we go 1,400 miles curvature of the earth, supposedly, over to the west. And boom, right into the middle of this volcanic island chain, which takes us all the way across the Pacific. So we go 1,400, 1,400, already measured, 1,400, 1,400. And then guess what? Over here on this side of South America, we go 1,400 miles off the coast of South America over to Ascension Island. So it's 1,400 from Ascension to South America. I already measured it. It's down to the mile, 1,400. From the center of these two, it's approximately 1,400, depending on where you measure from in the middle, of course. But trying to get it exactly in the middle is kind of hard, but you can do it. It's 1,400 miles spacing on all these islands all the way across the Pacific. And I made a whole video on this. So here's our earthquake. It's coming in just north of Easter Island, where all the heads are buried up to their necks. Hashtag mud flood. No, Dutch, they buried them up to their necks for ritual purposes. Dirt. Okay, so let's go up into Alaska and talk about the earthquakes coming out of Alaska, going down into the United States. Now, if you're a new viewer, many of my viewers um, who are new don't understand or they think I'm kind of trying to juice it to get you in the U.S. to watch to the end. The reason we cover the United States at the end, I had somebody say that to me in my last video, that I was trying to juice views to the end on the U.S., and that's why I didn't cover the U.S. first. I'm like, gosh, you know, you've been on YouTube too long, guys. Look, the United States is the last to receive the flow. It goes all the way around the entire Pacific first. It goes out over to Europe first. It goes out and across up through Japan and around through Alaska and then back down into the United States from the northwest. And it comes in on the edge of the North American craton and goes across the United States following the craton edge from the plate boundary out on the coast. So energy comes in from the west coast and flows across this thing. Now, let's take a look and see what's flowed across. Starting up in Alaska, up here to the Pacific Northwest, coming in on the plate boundary. Four is going all the way across and a five in the north. Well, you could take that down to a 4.9. Go back two days, boom, take it all, add it together, equals a five. Out in front of it, a swarm of earthquakes right at the Yukon-Canada border. Then, all of Canada quiet. Not really. Actually, we could even possibly go turn on the Canadian feed. However, I don't think it works on Earthquake 3D anymore. Go check their website. A little arcane to use. It's like a 1990s website. Anyway, there are earthquakes here. And what you would see is the same sized earthquakes that come out of Alaska and go down along the coast of Canada. But professionals don't want you to see that because then you'd see it flowing in to this. And let me turn down the magnitudes so you can see what I'm talking about since we have so many in the course of three days here. And let's turn down the rings so you can see the United States overall. And do you want to see a whole week or do you want to see two days? Two days is what we normally look at. Here's a full week. But what you should be able to see is there's a line of earthquakes coming out of where Yellowstone is, for instance, and going down through Utah, following the Wasatch Range. Then going down through Texas, it makes a U-shaped bend, goes up into Oklahoma, makes a hard right over to the east to the New Madrid seismic zone, and then goes up the east coast. You don't see any earthquakes up there because there's deliberate omission of earthquakes up in the northeast. We'll talk about that in a moment, but let's get back and look at two days worth of earthquakes because that's really all that matters to me for seeing the current movement and the current areas which are under stress. And that goes across the, one more time, edge of the craton. 
And so, starting in the northwest, for instance, up here, all along the coast of Washington, going down into Oregon. This is somewhat of a change from where we were over the past several months. Lines of earthquakes along the coast. That's a change, considering they weren't reporting hardly any earthquakes in Washington for many, many months on end, just a handful every day. So where are these locations? Well, if we go pull the coordinates, it's just a zero or a one, or actually this is a negative magnitude earthquake. Just by way of calculation, it's not like it's sucking in energy. It's, there's no black hole down below this location. At least I hope not. But let me go show you what's at the location. If we have a black hole down below here, we got a, we got a big, 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 big problem. You know why? This is the interior crater rising dome of Mount St. Helens, the lava dome. So if it's sucking in energy, we got a problem. <laughs> That's where the stack of earthquakes is down here in Washington. Just to the north, there's another brown splotch with a bunch of earthquakes all around it. 22 kilometers east, northeast of Ashford, Washington. Longtime viewers should already know what's there. Man, it's so quiet in here, you can hear the click of my freaking mouse. Crazy. Well, I'll be. Look at that. Amazing. We're down below the crater of Mount Rainier. So we were just down below the crater of Mount St. Helens. Now we're below the crater of Mount Rainier. What do the two have in common? Oh, there are large volcanoes along the coast of Washington. If we go up to the north, what do you want to bet? We're going to find some more. You want to go look? Let's go on up to Swede Heaven up in Washington. Okay, Swede Heaven. That's a name. You guys ever been there? I think we drove through here to go take radiation readings back in 2011 when Fukushima happened. I drove across the country taking radiation readings. Yeah, look at this. Set of power lines right next to this volcano called Three Fingers South. Do we have any info on it? Sweet heaven? Th nothing? Okay, all right. We don't have much information on it. Now, look at this. See this place called OSO, Washington? See the power lines? See this place? See this? It looks like a, a valley that the trees have been cut out. Now, I'm going to zoom in really close. What you're going to see are giant towers. I wonder if they have this in 3D buildings. Do you think they do? Wow, they actually do. Okay, check this out. These towers are VLF stations. Their wire is strung between each tower across that valley. You zoom in if you could see if the see the wire. Now notice it's moored down here into the mountain, right? But you can see it goes out and across. Now it doesn't capture the wire. But then down at the bottom of the valley, they have towers. And then this long strip of a road, quote unquote, road, that goes down to the power station down here. Power lines come in. Very low frequency. U.S. Naval, very low frequency station. I don't know the name of the place. Here, let me see if we can get a name of this place. Jim Creek. The Jim Creek Naval VLF station. Anyway, very low frequency in earthquakes. This gets in with solar and how can solar, a solar storm, induce earthquake activity. And I can just very quickly sum up the northern lights up in the upper atmosphere from a solar storm, charged particles hitting the upper ionosphere, produces a vibration, a very low frequency vibration. They actually recreate that using HARP up in Alaska, for instance. The H-A-A-R-P, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, where they use high frequency to pulse the ionosphere and create plasma in a giant ring or a ball, a sphere. And that ring, ball, or sphere vibrates and beats like a bass drum. And they use high frequency to create the plasma, ball, many kilometers wide, that does air glow just like the Northern Lights. And it vibrates out very low frequency, extremely low frequency, ELF, and ultra low frequency, ULF, depending on the size of the ball that they create using the high frequency. And that's how high frequency creates low frequency. And they use the low frequency to penetrate the Earth's crust, to look down for oil deposits, for instance, as the original patents for Harp State by Dr. Bernard Eastland. I almost sneezed into the microphone there, sorry. 
Dr. Bernard Eastland's patents for looking for oil deposits in the ground using very low frequency created from very high frequency plasmas in the atmosphere or ionosphere. So the same thing can cause earthquakes. The penetration of VLF into the crust, it's already proved. People denied that, like Mick West and Joe Rogan, when they came in and made fun of Dr. Brooks Agnew and tried to recreate a bogus weather modification experiment in a laboratory that was two feet wide or something, trying to cr create weather in a frickin' box two feet wide on the ground level, using radio waves. Gee, uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, they denied that there was an earthquake connection. And now we know, it's already proved, the studies have come out. VLF emitted from faults before earthquake activity, big earthquake activity. VLF coming up out of the earth and the peaks reaching up hundreds if not thousands of miles into the sky, up into the upper atmosphere and beyond picked up by satellites where they pick up the peaks of the waves coming out of the faults from that far down below. And that VLF, or ultra low frequency, spreads out away. It's electrically powered in the ground. And that right next to it, we have a VLF station and an earthquake swarm, a little outbreak taking place. As we go down to the south, this little cluster of earthquakes here, well, the other locations I showed you are all right next to volcanoes. And in one case, a VLF source. And electricity is VLF too, going through the power lines, by the way. But that's a transmitter from the U.S. Navy there. We're going down to the south. Where are we going? Into Oregon. Well, I'll be darned. The third set of volcanoes being hit, or third volcano being hit with a set of earthquakes, Mount Hood. Government Camp is the name of the nearest town. Go figure. Mount Hood Volcano. So now we have Mount Hood. We have Mount St. Helens, we have Mount Rainier, Three Fingers, and the VLF station, all going at once in a day all along the coast. There's a few small straggle earthquakes. One of them is an explosion over to the east. We don't need to even bother looking up. Further over to the east, you see this cluster of earthquakes that's inside the Yellowstone National Park. I don't think I need to tell you about Yellowstone. Now, what I do need to tell you is these earthquakes are actual earthquakes. Yellowstone gets hundreds, if not thousands, of tremors per day. Tremors are small vibrations as the magma shifts, which actually can register as an earthquake. But these are actual earthquakes. These are actually above. If you look at the depth on these, they're like one kilometer deep. They're above the magma chamber for Yellowstone that comes up to the surface at the park, which is right on the edge of the North American Craton. Look at Montana going down into Wyoming on the Craton diagram. You'll see the brownish, rusty color that goes, oh wait, hold on. I, I hope that wasn't on the whole time. Oh man, hold on. Let me make sure. I don't even know if my Craton diagram is going to show. <laughs> okay, the Craton diagram might not show. We're having technical difficulties. But going across, going over to the edge of the Craton, we have a stack of earthquakes at Yellowstone. Back behind it, the biggest of the bunch in the whole Northwest centered in between our two clusters of earthquakes. One cluster over at Yellowstone, the other clusters at three different stratovolcanoes, or four, up the coast. And what's in the middle? The magma chamber for Yellowstone. It's down below Idaho. They took new VLF measurements, actually, using VLF of the magma chamber. University of Wyoming released it back in 2015. And they found out it's 11 grand canyons in size. And it goes down below the whole area and comes up, or curls in a U-shape, back up towards Oregon and Washington. And the deepest part of the feeder for the magma chamber itself is below central Idaho at the Chalice Reserve, where this earthquake swarm is taking place in 3.1, now happening. So let's recap. Volcano, 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 and an explosion and a VLF earthquake. No exaggeration in the Northwest. So what could cause all the volcanoes to move? The same thing that's causing the rest of the entire plate to move. The same thing that's causing the entire West Pacific to move. The same thing that caused a bunch of sevens this past week. A shift is coming into the United States from the Northwest. The only thing missing was our LA hit this past week. LA did not get hit. I was 240 miles off. I'm trying to get it down to 200 miles. So, I mean, I was 40 miles off from my 200 mile warned area. And a 5.4 hit just south of L.A. Again, just south of California, down here in the Gulf. 
Okay, so, and that was in Mexico. Again, people, I'm trying to get it down to 200. I'm not perfect, but if I get it at 240, I, that's the earthquake we're looking for. I'm just off on my location from this past week. Warning. So what happened since? Well, the LA Basin got hit. <laughs> Go figure, right? Okay, so all of a sudden the LA Basin gets hit, going right down here along the coast, going down into... Uh, Mexico itself. And let me go pull the quake here and just show you we're at Yorba Linda right next to Glen Avon. And I mentioned Glen Avon and Yorba Linda. I, I don't think I mentioned Yorba Linda actually, but I mentioned Glen Avon. And uh, sorry, I didn't mean to bang my hand on the desk. I get excited, guys. Again, it was quiet. There was nothing in the LA basin. And all of a sudden in the East LA, boom, three comes rolling in with the other three and going down south. Let's just see how close we are. Here's the earthquake epicenter, and we have a bunch of, uh, well, look at that, golf courses. Oh, yeah, I got the 3D buildings on. Hold on, let me turn those off. There we go. So, okay, we're, we're so close. I mean, literally, guys, there's your Belinda. Here's our oil pumping operations that I talked to that go down to the east by southeast and west by northwest all the way up here, meeting into North L.A., and I'll measure from North LA. I just want to see how far off I am on the location. Again, if I'm looking somewhere up here and it hits down here, again, it's not that far, but let's just measure from Pasadena. This is in miles. I mean, if we go all the way down, if we go all the way down the fault, we're at 40 to 50 miles. So, yeah, I mean, we are, we're again, we're in 20 to 30 miles. Again, I was just measuring to right here even. But if we go all the way down here, it's 50 miles. I'm trying to get it within 200. So, two threes hit, and then a 3.5 south of the border. A new earthquake has been reported here in the eastern part of the valley. Let's go take a look at the smaller activity, too, and see what's going on along the coast. So, the coast is lit up in the past day and a half to two days, going from northern California, coming out of the Juan de Fuca, going down to the creeping section of the... San Andreas, then further down to Parkfield and stopping dead cold turkey at Parkfield, jumping over into the valley where this is now taking place. Do you guys know what's at Parkfield? You know why we're jumping off the San Andreas and going over to the valley and getting excited over here in the Eastern Valley? There's two reasons. One, we're jumping off the San Andreas because there's a bunch of drill points right next to the San Andreas by just a few miles, hundreds of thousands of them. Then on the other side of the valley, there's a volcanic feature that I had to discover myself. You want to see him? Let's go look. Come on. Why not? Hey, come along with me. Let's turn off all this other gobbledygook I got open here. Here's the plate boundary again from the USGS. Comes in out of the Juan de Fuca. Goes down through the San Andreas everybody knows about. Here's our most recent reported quake. There it is. 3.1 just in the past few minutes. USGS site. So what's there? Let's pull coordinates. Y'all come along with me on this voyage of discovery. And you can see what I found. So how did I find this and what did I find? Well, I'll tell you how. First, a bunch of earthquakes started to strike here. Then fires broke out here. So first earthquakes, then fires. Got my eye drawn to the area. So I started to look at it and I turned off all my place marks and all my crap and everything. I maybe turned off even all the names. Just started to look at the area a little bit. And then I brought it in down like this. And again, you got fires over here on the east side of the valley. You got f fires on the north side, earthquakes on here, 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 all the way. And I started to see it then. I started to look and I was like, wait a second. Hold on. I, I have a, a elevation measurement tool down in the lower right hand corner here. See where it says Google Earth. It'll tell you your elevation. So over here, we are at 850 feet above sea level. Okay, moving my mouse around, you see it's like eight, seven to eight. We move it over here to the center of this thing. We go up to 1400. We bring it back over here. Look at that. We go back down to eight. What's going on over on this side? Well, this actually goes up, back, down, and then it goes into foothills, so it's kind of hard to see. But it comes back down on this side, down to around a thousand, and then goes quickly back up. Wait, wait, let me, can't even get my mouse on it. Anyway, it goes back up on this side. It's a, it's a giant circular bulging lacolith. A lacolith is created when magma bulges into the plate but does not erupt. Now, let me back this out and show you. Right across the range, 
almost like a yin yang where the range is in between or a percentage sign. Over here on this side is a super volcano called Long Valley Caldera on the east side over here. And it's almost the same size as the bulging Lacolith on this side. So one side we have a blast point super volcano, thousand cubic kilometers of meltdown below called Long Valley. On the other side we have a bulging Lacolith that gets hit with a bunch of earthquakes and fires around the outside edge. That's what drew my eye to this area first. Then it happened again down here at this thing. This is another one that's collapsed in the past, apparently. So it bulged in the path, past at some point, but then sank and retreated out or hardened over. Anyway, a bunch of earthquakes struck around this thing. A bunch of fires broke around outside the edge of this thing. Drew my eye to it. I was like, wait a second. Wow, that's, a, that's another one. Then it happened a third time here at a place called Shaver Lake. This place, this is Shaver Lake. And a bunch of fires broke out around the outside edge of this thing. And a bunch of earthquakes broke around the outside edge of this thing. And I saw it then, the ripples in here, and this mimics a lacolith, or many lacoliths, that we've seen, for instance, over in Iran. So that's three of them. There's one here. There's one here. This almost looks like a crater. And then the one in the middle at Shaver Lake is a little harder to see, but it goes back up to Shaver Lake, which has a techni technical basin at the top or a fold at the top containing the water. So that's where our earthquakes are going over to in the edge of the valley. Not just anywhere random. It's going over to straight up volcanic features over on the east side of the valley. Now, oh, hold on one second, guys. No, that wasn't any kind of uh, 2D sound, guys. This is my freaking chair in this quiet office up against this damn desk. Here, let me recreate the sound. <laughs> let me recreate that sound. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay, look, look. It happens from time to time that you're going to hear sounds in the background that you think is one thing, but it's not. For crying out loud, guys, get your head out of the gutter. Okay, along... <laughs> wake up, everybody, wake up. Along the coast, there's a diagonal line of earthquakes that jumps over into the valley. There's 100,000 drill points going from where the earthquakes jump off the San Andreas, right here at Parkfield. Let me turn my borders and labels back on. See, it says Parkfield. Right over here is where our tens of thousands of drill points first start. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. And then we go down to the south and we pick up across this whole mountain range at Missouri Triangle with insane overdrive number of drill points. And then... As if that wasn't enough, this is the San Andreas. So the earthquakes come down, jump over, go over to your volcanoes, and then all the way down here, this is all drilled. Right up to the San Andreas. Right up to it. Again, they look like ants on the ground. Right over the valley, boom. Fault, oil. And they quite literally bring it right up to the fault. I don't think it's smart to drill next to just the most famous plate boundaries and faults on the planet, unless you're trying to direct the flow your way. But then that would mean the professionals all the way back in the 50s knew that there was a flow going through the area, going in a certain direction, and that they could direct it. And that would be a conspiracy. Now down here, we go down along the south tip of the valley, and you'll see a line of earthquakes going the opposite of all the others. All the other earthquakes are going northwest to southeast for the most part. We haven't even talked about the California-Nevada border yet. But here, we're going southwest to northeast. That's the Garlock Fault. Many people might know about the Garlock Fault going out across over to the ocean even, but it's not really the, gar the Garlock there. Let me show it to you on the USGS plate boundary map one more time. Zooming in on Southern California here. And we have to actually add a feature, U.S. faults. Then you will see it. This is the Garlock. And you see it, it actually extends over across. I, what do they call it there? The Big Pine? I don't, I don't know the name of it. Yeah, Big Pine Fault Zone. So Garlock here, once it crosses the San Andreas, even though it's going in the same direction. Different name. But the earthquakes are going right across it. The whole thing lit up with quakes like a wall. So let's recap. Let's recap this whole thing now. The volcanoes going up here in Washington, all along the coast. 
jumping over to the magma chamber at Yellowstone, jumping up to the surface where we have surface fracturing happening on the edge of the Craton. Then we go down to the south. Pretty obvious. We're going along the coast. Diagonal line goes down to Parkfield, jumps over to the drill points, jumps off the San Andreas, and over to the volcanic points over at the east side of the valley. We meet back up down here to the south. We're on the Garlock. We go down here along the fault, down towards the ocean like a wall meeting it. Now on the east side of California, it's going to be a repeat of everything I just did, volcanically speaking. So literally, starting up here in the north tip of the valley, we'll go here at Bella Vista, and this should bring us in right next to the Inskip Volcanic Hills, or Inskip Buttes and Black Butte. So we'll go show you these spots. All these volcanoes tend to move before we get big activity, guys. So just got to pay attention to it now. Here's the earthquake activity. And here's Black Butte, marked by the Smithsonian. If you want to read about the cone of Black Butte cone, it's got power lines going over each set of cones. That's no accident. They're putting power lines over all these to collect energy to sell back to the public. Biggest secret the power company ever kept from you. Anyway, here's our earthquake epicenter. Right across from it is Silver Lake and Latour Butte. Many people might remember three, four, five years ago, series of earthquakes breaking out here next to Latour Butte. Me bringing up Latour Butte, which is a Pleistocene Ice Age volcano that nobody even knows about. I didn't even know about it. Just a bunch of earthquakes struck next to this place. Then a bunch of fires broke out, like at Paradise, for instance, down here to the south. And I'm talking huge fires broke out after we saw earthquake activity in the north part of the valley. So that's where our 0.9 is. Now where's the 1.2? Chester, California. Okay, let's go zoom in and see. Sure is a lot of volcanic activity for it's small. It doesn't mean eruption. It means something else. Shifting's going on, usually followed by fires. So here's our earthquake epicenter, Mount Harkness, Bonte Peak, Black Cinder. And the names on these are pretty creative. Black Cinder Rock. Now that looks like it's been burned by forest fire too. Let's find a spot that's erupted. So Mount Harkness is probably the nearest. Ditmer is marked from the Smithsonian. Our fissures go up to the north and down to the south. And Mount Lassen, the stratovolcano, is no more than 10 miles over to the west. Or wait, maybe that's further. Hold on. 13. 13 miles over to the west. Okay, so we're at the foot of a stratovolcano at the side of an ancient Pleistocene volcano, and we're directly next to Black Cinder and Bonte Peak. All volcanoes, that's where we are. Indisputable. So both of these, Northern California. Now we jump over across, right across the border, and I mean we were quite literally right on the border of California and Nevada. Just north of Lake Tahoe, there's three sets of quakes, and then in Pyramid Lake, just north. So Lake Tahoe, north side, and Pyramid Lake. Let me go show you what's there. Something else huge that I discovered. And I had to discover this myself, too. Well, all the professionals, I guess, just somehow missed it. It's so weird. Check it out. Look what I found. So first, let me explain how I found it and what I found. How I found this giant oval shape sandwiched between Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake, a bunch of earthquakes broke out around the outside of this. Then a bunch of fires broke out around the outside edge of this. Sound familiar, guys? How many times am I going to tell you this in one freaking broadcast? First earthquakes, then fires, and then that drew my eye to it and say, hey, that's a giant oval shape with a bunch of its own volcanoes around the outside edge. Now we're going to go down to the south. I'm going to show you a similar one that's smaller. This is the one the professionals admit exists. This is Long Valley Caldera, and it is lined with its own volcanoes, and it gets hit with earthquakes around the outside edge in the shape of the oval shape that it is, and again, fires, earthquakes break out around the outside edge of this regularly, every year almost. They try to blame it on this and that, the fires, I mean. Now, same thing happens here. Now, to seal the deal that this is some kind of ancient volcanic caldera, on both sides of it, we have two folded deep basins, Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake, somewhat equally spaced on both sides. And then we have two geothermal features that are equally spaced on both sides. Let me show you. Steamboat Springs, huge geothermal pumping operation here. Humans exploiting the steam. 
Now, almost the same distance on the north side of our giant oval here are the needles at Pyramid Lake right here. The tufa deposits and large geothermal fumaroles and geysers of there, right there. They have not been exploited. They're on Native American land. So this thing, ancient caldera, guys, ancient supervolcano, two folds, two deep basins on either side, two geothermal fields on each side lined with volcanoes and gets hit with earthquakes and fires around the outside edge. Now let's move down to the south. That's where those quakes are on both sides. Again, up here at Pyramid Lake, going across and in the middle. Let's go look at the 3.1 out here in Nevada. This is an interesting location, man. Oh, wow. Look. Oh, man. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is like a sign that you're not supposed to look it up when they do this. Just so you know. When they just list an earthquake in, like, Colorado or Nevada, you're supposed to take that as a sign to kind of buzz off and not look it up. But I've got to do it because it's the biggest earthquake of the bunch across the whole west, except for out in California. So where are we going? Oh, nowhere in particular. Just a really interesting spot here. Big Butte. Big Butt. No, that's, that's Big Butte. But there's other things here nearby that I think people might be interested in if I turn on our, well, nearby information. See this right here? See where it says Battle Mountain? See up to the north, across? We have a U.S. military testing range, ranges, I should say, through here. We have um, testing grounds. Now, I don't know what they would be testing out here, but I do know that there are several testing grounds out here. There, oh, you can see them. They're labeled out here, 11 mile flat and so forth. And we have a large pit mine up here on the north side. Now, somebody labeled it as a nice little mine. Absolutely massive, and it's going down. This is an open pit mine. So look how deep we're going here. We're going down about 1,000 feet. Yeah, it's about 1,000 feet deep. So between the military testing range and the giant pit mine that's there, it makes me wonder, is there anything else here nearby that we need to be aware of? Again, if they're doing a lot of mining like this, there's a reason that there may have been something else here that we just need to look into further. Um, I can tell you, this is on the edge of an ancient star fort that goes right through here. The peak pinnacle comes up in between these and goes down. We can You, you might be able to see it here. Do you see it? it? Keeps going this way. So we're right along it again. But now again, we've got other things out here, US military and so forth that they build on the edge of these ancient star forts. And this earthquake is not listed as a blast. It's listed at 7.9 kilometers deep. I have to make a big deal about it because it's about the same sized earthquake as what struck at Yellowstone. If we go over to the east or we go down to the south, we're going to run into pretty much the same thing. Over to the east, over in Utah, here next to a volcanic plateau, and down here at the California-Nevada border, I already showed it to you like three times already in this update, there's a super volcano there. So at the tip of the arrow, there's a volcanic field, and back at the back side of the arrow, there's a super volcano. And let me show them to you so you can see what both look like. One more time. Here is our super volcano, Long Valley Caldera. And then we have an arrow that goes east. And it goes all the way out into Utah, where I will just pull the coordinates. That'll be a little easier than trying to just eyeball this. Circleville. Circleville. We're going to Circleville, guys. Sounds like a nice place. Let's see what's in Circleville, shall we? Do you want to know? Inquiring minds would like to know. So would I. So let's find out. Cattle. Lots of cattle grazing. Birch Creek Mountain, Circleville Mountain. As I back it out. Ah, okay, okay. Ah, man, this goes back a while. So here we have a basalt fissure that I had to, again, one of these features that you have to find yourself. A fissure that formed, and you can see it. Let me zoom in and show you. At some point in the past, a volcanic fissure formed here. This is not just a cliffside, guys. It's black basalt that flowed out here. So think of like a tear in the ground in Hawaii that formed a long time ago. 
but really look where it is. It's at the foot of Crater Knoll, and Crater Knoll is a very well-pronounced, well, there it is, very well-pronounced old cone, spatter cone. And Cinder Crater, the Smithsonian Mark, Mineral Mountains Cove Fort, Volcanic Field, is just like four miles to the north. So it's really, really close to the actual marked volcano. Anyway, basalt fish are there, earthquakes on the south side. Now, when you guys get out here and start looking at the back country out here in Utah, you're going to start to find some really weird stuff. I'm going to tell you a quick story about something I found out here. I was looking through an area like this, and we were way back up in the mountain peaks like this. I zoomed in, and I saw that there were rows of old pinyon pine trees that had to be at least a few hundred years old, and stacked rock going on as far as the eye can see in a shape like this. And then I found what looked like, and I don't have it marked, this is several years ago, I found what looked like a old pyramid, but a Aztec looking one, like one of the step pyramids. And I took screenshots of it and took shots of the area and just, you know, again, wrote the Department of Natural Resources in Utah to tell them about it. And for instance, take a look at these. You can see the lines in there. They say that the farmers got out here 100 years ago and to control erosion, scraped away every mountaintop. Yeah, that's not from imagery. This is not from imagery, guys. This is in the actual landscape. And they're perfect straight. Okay. So they tried to say that it was farmers that scraped away the thing and that the pyramid was just a, uh, a figure of the imagination, a paradelia, that it was, you're just seeing something. Now, what you're going to find is that there's evidence of an ancient civilization that used to exist out here, especially in the desert west, where it can't be easily hidden. Walls, long structures, miles long, something that farmers couldn't have done 100 years ago because they didn't have gas-powered this and that. And even if they did have gas-powered this and that, you'd need a tanker full of, uh, uh, not just a tanker, you'd need a whole train load of gasoline to power your tractor. And if it's steam, you're going to need a bunch of coal. So anyway, 100 years ago, it's barren land out here. And in 1850 is when supposedly Utah was founded. So that's a big deal to see that kind of stuff out there and you start finding it. You get earthquakes next to it. Have to pay attention. Hashtag Tartaria. Now, speaking of Tartaria, we're going to go from the California-Nevada border at the supervolcano, and we're going to go down across our nuclear test sites. Now, here's a cluster of earthquakes. Here's a cluster of earthquakes. Stack of earthquakes versus cluster. What's the difference? A stack, a swarm. Small swarm, but it's at a place called Goldfield, Nevada. So we'll pull the coordinates, go look it up, see what's there. And I said... Tartaria again, I'm mentioning that name again, the hidden civilization that nobody ever told you about that they tried to say was China but isn't. It's at Crimea, not China. Okay, where are we? We're here in California. We're right next to the Ubehivi craters. Right here are our nuke sites that we went up into the 1980s nuking with Europe. So it's not like it was just the United States. And uh, I can get the test information on a lot of that. Here's the UK, Operation Grenadier Egmont, December 9th, 1984, 103 kilotons. Some of the smaller blasts are over here in the valley. And here's Area 51 over here on the east side at Groom Lake. Now, all these locations fall on the edge of this giant star fort that comes out and extends from Mojave Desert, which I will show you in a moment, that goes, well, wow, we got a lot of gobbledygook on here. It goes out across over past Vegas and out to St. George, and it goes out across down to Southern California into Arizona and bends back this way. That this star fort shape on the side, we've nuked the hell out of it over here. Now, that's troubling. We'll talk about that in the future, but we have a bunch of earthquakes going right out to it and beyond it over just to the east to the old nuke sites at the surface. We have a quarry here, right here at the border. We're going to ignore that quake at the quarry. We're going to ignore the same size quake over at Boron, California, over at the quarry. Or are we going to ignore it? Are we going to ignore it? Should we ignore things? Now, I don't know if we should ignore things. Let's just talk about this for a second. So from here, I'm going to trace it out for you. From here up to here is the pinnacle tip. Back down to here, and back down to here. This is the classic star fort shape. 
It's 300 miles long from tip, 300 exact, from tip up here to tip here. And obviously it's 100 miles or so from the bottom tip down to the south tip, if you will. And in the middle is Edwards Air Force Base. On the right hand side are the nuke test sites in Area 51, and on the left side, left side or left hand side is 29 Palms Military Base, U.S. Marines. And that matters because our earthquakes striking next to the spots out in the middle where there's quote unquote quarries next to the military base. That takes me down to Southern California where we already covered the quakes down at the pumping operations. Is there anything else I need to show you? Texas, Oklahoma, do we need to look it up in Texas and Oklahoma? Texas and Oklahoma is straight up drill points. It's not even up for debate. If you don't know about the drill points in Texas, there are millions of them. And there's about 500 to 600,000 in Oklahoma. And all of the earthquakes, every single one of them is coming in next to a drill point. So I could literally just randomly grab any one of these quakes here in Oklahoma or Texas, and it'll show you an oil well. And not just fracking. Well, again, we're dealing with oil and gas, but oil. So if anybody ever told you that wastewater earthquakes are what causes, or if wastewater disposal is what causes earthquakes man-made, they are incorrect. It is everything from oil and gas to geothermal, drill points in the crust. And Mother Nature makes her own punch points. Those are the volcanic and geothermal spots where Mother Nature pumps. There, pumps up, pushes up. There are our jacks at the surface and they go all over the area. Every one of these little square spots on the ground is a different spot where we have jacks, pumps, pipelines, storage tanks to put the chemicals in, and they inject those chemicals down into the ground to break apart the shale at the fracking ops. So there are some fracking there, a lot of them. And every one of these, these little square, whatever they, you want to call them, square pad on the ground, they're not farming any kind of agriculture. They're doing oil and gas. Then you see how many there are. Literally, it just goes on and on and on. And I can just randomly zoom in on any one of them. Here, let's just do that. Just grab one from the middle. And we can do it all over the state. Literally, we can just drag it down the state and just voop, and zoom in and you'll find your oil well. I'm not kidding. You like that sound effect? People with earphones on. You get like some kind of ASMR moment. They're like, oh. Hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right, it's too quiet in here, man. It's getting freaky. So let's recap and just wind this sucker down. We're looking for a new round of major earthquake activity in the next several days after the arrival of the X-Class flare. Should be arriving any time now. We have a spread of the same sized earthquakes going across 10,000 miles, quite literally from north of New Zealand all the way up to Japan and all the way over to China. Then a quiet zone across North India and we pick back up over at Europe again with the same sized earthquakes. And the same sized earthquakes are going across the other side of the plate too. So it's not like you're getting left out over in Central and South America either. Literally 4.9, 4.8, 4.4, 4.4, 4.4. How much energy do you think it would take to move the quote unquote whole planet in a day on a 4.4 to 5.4 basis. Now I've got this a beef now with this whole planet thing. People are asking me if I become a flat earth goon. I'm like, no, dude, I think it's even worse than that. I think we might have a real problem. It might, we, it might not be flat or round, dude. All I know is that it's starting to look like I'm only getting half the earthquakes, or I'm sorry, half the planet. Previously, I told you earthquakes get to the letter X. And then I said, well, they must be going back through the planet and coming back out the antipode with new deep earthquakes. And that made sense to me. But there's something else that could make sense. I might only be seeing half the planet. And all the number system and everything has been devised just for that. And that when it gets over here, when this earthquake spread to there, I'm not supposed to see where it goes beyond. And it takes a couple more days and it comes back out. It, it literally just flows back around and comes back around. And it would be, it, what that would mean, guys, and I hate to say it, but it would mean that the earth is not 
round. Or it is round, and I'm only getting half the earth fed to me, quake-wise. But they're showing us supposedly the whole earth, which would mean half the earth would be being hidden or something. So either the earth is way bigger. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? I, I, I'm trying to get my head around it myself. I would have never thought to even look. I can't believe it. But there it is. So I'm looking into it. Don't count me out. Don't count me in. I'm not getting on anybody's bandwagon. People might have to get on mine after what I find. And if I find anything. So help me God. If I find out that it's a disc or a ring or a diamond or an asteroid shape or it's convex, concave, or it's not there at all and it's a matrix, I'm going to tell you. I don't care how many subscribers I lose or gain. You probably won't even hear me. I'll probably get shut down if I find the real truth. But whatever it is, I'm going to find out there's something wrong. Earthquakes going around half the planet. Go back through. Come back out the other side. Like some kind of video game. It never dawned on me that I'd be, be that they'd be hiding it from me. That they would literally, like, when it gets halfway around the planet, cut. And then two days later, it shows back up on the other side. Quote, unquote, the other side. But really, it's just coming around. The, the reason they would be doing that, there would be other lands out there that you could see from, like, what if there's other continents that were not being shown, basically, is where I'm going with this. I know it sounds crazy, but there's some reason they're not showing a live, far away view of the Earth in high resolution. I'm thinking we would probably see a bunch more lands out there and that the Earth would be way bigger, maybe, and it might not be shaped like you think at all. And that's what's troubling to me. I'm going down that rabbit hole for you guys so you don't have to. And I don't like where this is leading. First of all, I'll have to make a new earthquake program. I'll have to have somebody else make a new earthquake program. I'm not a programmer myself. I have to click a button. I'm like, let's click on flat mode. But guess what that means? I'd have to devise a new coordinate system. I'd have to take the current 360 degree round earth coordinate system and somehow devise a new translated flat coordinate system that still plots the earthquakes on some kind of flat thing. And what if it's a toroid or a diamond shape? Then we're really screwed. I, now we're getting into the levels where you have to be some kind of geometry matrix to even understand it. All I know is something's not right. Speaking of something not being right, hey, they said earthquakes couldn't be forecast and that they were completely random up until I came along. Now you know. They're not random. They're following the plate boundaries and the craton edges. And the earthquakes are the same size spreading out across the planet for the most part. It happened last week with the 7.6s, with the huge quakes. 7.6 on one side, 7.6 on the other. 7 on one side, 7 on the other. Happens with 6s, happens with 5s, happens with 4s. I haven't really paid attention to the twos and ones yet internationally, but maybe someday I will, and we'll see that it's even twos and ones going back and forth. I would urge you to pay attention to the flow, the way the arrows point, because those are the next spots to be hit as the flow spreads out. Then, the most simple thing and one of the most complex things to understand, so it's really simple, but people have such a hard time understanding this, we find the halfway points between the current sets of earthquakes following the red lines of the plate boundaries. So between this 4.4 and this 4.6, for instance, that goes around the plate boundary on two sides, Taklamakan Desert and Nepal. Both are going to get hit at the middle point, and it'll end up looking like a letter A with one arm going down the Taklamakan Desert and one arm going down and connecting across Nepal. And there could even be a third one in the middle, but I mean, we're getting to the end of the week of next week's forecast. So Anyway, halfway point between these sets of quakes. It's a perfect example, right? But then you look at how many sets there are. So the halfway point between this 4.4 and the earthquake over in Turkey is going to get hit if you follow the plate boundary down through Iran, through central Iran and south Iran. Then we go over into Europe, and there's a whole bunch of them, right? Halfway point between the big stack over here in Turkey and the smaller stack over in Greece. Where does that put us? Look where the rings overlap. It makes it pretty easy to see where the halfway points are. Western Turkey, along the plate boundary to the southeast of Crete. Halfway point between the earthquake up in Italy and the earthquake down in Greece. Following the plate boundary up through Campobasso, Italy, right here at the spur of the boot tip of Italy. Now do you understand? It's, it's, it's again very easy to find the halfway points between sets of earthquakes when they're spaced out real far like that. When you get really close in clustered like this, I call this a hot mess. And you look at the middle of where all the rings overlap on your hot mess. It's like throwing three or four pebbles in a pond and watching where all the rings interfere or interferometry, uh, where they overlap with each other. 
So that would be North Indonesia, for instance, is going to get hit by the combined total of what's on all sides. So something bigger is going to be hitting in Indonesia. Same with where the rings overlap here, but you don't see it. It's a big open area. Oh, the halfway point, I'm sorry. The halfway point is Sumatra going down to Krakatau Volcano between this little itty bitty earthquake up at the tip of Sumatra and this four down here at uh, East Timor, Indonesia. So the halfway point between the two, if you go around the bend of the plate, brings us right here in the middle at the volcano. So I'm just giving you example upon example upon example of halfway points. These two are halfway points. Zooming in here, Solomon Islands. So when I start seeing a bunch of earthquakes like this, I know it's about to take the next step up because all those halfway points are going to get hit by something larger. And then after that, something larger. As we pump in more energy from the deep quakes, do you understand now? And I can't figure out how the professionals miss this because it's pretty simple. But it requires you to look at earthquakes in an outside perspective, I suppose. Maybe that's how they missed it. Oh, man. All right. This has been a long update. Do you guys have an earthquake plan? Man, oh, man. Do you know what to do when an earthquake strikes? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller. Bueller. I'm not at 31 flavors. I'm not passed out. But I will tell you guys, you need to take shelter underneath a table or a desk. And if you don't have a table or a desk to take shelter underneath, you should get one. It should be made out of wood. That's pretty basic. So wood or a metal. You can do metal too. So skip the glass and skip the plastic. So wood and metal, table or desk, going to protect you from things that are falling. But... Sometimes your structure is not capable of withstanding a large earthquake at all, uh, depending on what kind of structure. It can be a stone stack cinder block building, can be a brick stacked structure, even concrete building sometimes. It's not made proper. And you would need an exit plan, but then you get into such a hairy situation where you're going to be running outside and you could break your leg and sprain your ankle. Just running, running during an earthquake is apparently hard. I wouldn't know. I've never been in a quake at all, knock on wood. So, that's weird, right? Not even a single small earthquake. I could tell you some stories about that. Pretty weird. Don't have an earthquake machine or an anti-earthquake machine, but I sure would like to make one. Got a few ideas on that. All right, we'll record this, hit save, and upload it to YouTube. We'll watch it back in a wonderful premiere where you guys can all Follow along with me and chat as we're sitting there talking to each other while I'm talking on screen. It's kind of weird to hear yourself, by the way. I'll be back. Enjoy this update. How long is it? One hour and 17 minutes. Oh, God. I've got the gift of gab. Just ask my wife. That's why she stuck me in here on a microphone. Peace out.